Here we go. So yes, hello to everybody that is here now and is just joining us. Uh, as you know, we're doing a Q&A tonight with James Campbell from Intellect Books, uh, from live from Bristol. <laughs> and um, we're going to talk about uh, academic publishing, um, specifically since I asked people that were going to participate up front what they want to cover. Uh, we're going to talk about basic ideas of how to write a book proposal, especially if you're also turning your dissertation into a monograph, because I know that's a big concern for a lot of people, especially in Germany. Um, and also move on to uh, questions about journal publishing um, and some other basic ideas. Uh, I know people were wondering about kind of more specialized projects and that kind of thing. Um, so we're just gonna have a chat. I'm gonna ask some questions, uh, maybe also weigh in, especially on the German thing. And um, if there's anything that pops up, just write it in the chat and we're gonna pick up on it as well. So I hope the sound and everything is good for everybody. So if nobody is protesting, then I hope it's fine. All right. Um, yeah, uh, I should probably say that I uh, did exactly the thing we're going to talk about. I wrote my dissertation at a German university in English, and then I needed a publisher to turn it, um, to publish it as a monograph, and I did that with intellect. Um, and I also did that thanks to James and his help. So <laughs> we have a very specific case study we can use um, and, and talk from experience, obviously. So um maybe let's let's talk a bit more generally first about uh book proposals so a lot of people were just wondering like what are common mistakes you see um from people handing in book proposals maybe you can also just generally say what book proposals look like at intellect because i know that they always look like they look different from publisher to publisher yeah Ooh. um okay well first of all there's uh, sort of a common misnomer and this is based upon sort of like traditional book proposals from certain certain publishing houses, especially those that are perhaps affiliated with universities, like such as the traditional university presses, that you need to uh, have already perhaps completed the monograph or the or, or the manuscript in in many respects already, or certainly have large large amounts of it complete. So that's the first thing you don't need to do, um, depending on who you're shopping your proposal to. Um, you know, you can potentially, especially in this day and age, Intellect would do this, Bloomsbury would do this, a number of other publishing houses would do this, English language publishers, um, uh, where, you know, we would offer you a contract subject to peer review, and that would obviously depend a little bit on your CV, um, on, you know, perhaps who's, who would vouch for the project, how far down the line it is, maybe we would ask for samples, all these different things. But some people wait until the book is, or the manuscript is also, you know, almost complete before they start shopping around a proposal. So that's your first mistake. You don't want to do that. You want to start um, sort of looking at potential publishing houses who might be interested in working with you. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, early down the line, I mean, specifically if you're writing a, a thesis, you want to be looking um, at shopping that proposal around to turn it into a monograph fairly early in the process. And that's something that's increasingly happening more and more, I think, both in terms of, I think, because the job market is so competitive. Um, I think the publishing market itself is very competitive and it's becoming in many ways increasingly difficult to get published, especially if it's, you know, turning a thesis into a monograph. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna kind of go all over the place here. So you're gonna have to bear with me and just ask me specifics. So uh, one other thing, I mean, again, if we specifically want to talk about thesis for a minute, they, there, are, there are many companies out there, reputable companies, that would have strong peer review processes and excellent distribution, you know, manufacturing, production qualities, all these things. Um, and they will specialize in publishing dissertations or theses, uh, whereas others won't be interested at all. So you want to do your research and your due diligence and know who you're approaching with what kind of project. I mean, that's something you often see. I mean, intellect is happy to consider a, you know, a dissertation. But again, one of the things that we'd want you to do is be honest and upfront about where the, what this content is and where it's coming from. Um, this is a thesis. This is a master's dissertation. Could even be an undergraduate dissertation. As long as it's up to a certain standard, it's going to go through the same peer review process. What I often find is people submit their work 
um, and they hide behind uh, bullshit basically and of course that comes back to haunt you uh, later down the line and of course someone like myself or, or my colleagues who are even more astute than I they will have seen every trick in the book and they will have seen people try to hide things so I would just I would be I'd really strongly advocate that you're honest about everything you know um, when you're submitting a proposal don't try to don't try to oversell a project don't don't try and make it something it isn't if it's an academic monograph that's um, that's easy for us because we know what we're dealing with and we know how we can fit that into our list and we can work with our partners globally to ensure that we can make a success of that and you know that will affect the kind of book that we turn out at the end of the day when it when it, when it comes to publishing and printing the thing but um so often people will oversell and you know they'll sort of say oh yeah this is going to have um the well, they use the words the terms that, that that drives fear into the heart of most commissioning editors this book will have crossover appeal it will not have crossover appeal it it it, it, it some projects do and some projects do err on the side of more trade or specialist and and it's interesting because sabrina was obviously talking about her own project that we have uh, contracted and that's one where we are treating it as a specialist academic title which means that we do actually perceive that it does have a wider market than purely scholarly you know researchers teachers students who are working within the kind of fields um and that's partly due to the subject matter being based on disney and things of that nature but um yeah so just be honest whenever you're doing a proposal be clear and honest about what your project is um and prior to that you need to look at different publishers and and you need to put you know put your ego in check maybe as well or definitely do your research and due diligence to find out who might be the best publisher for the project not the one that you want to work with necessarily you know verso everyone wants to do say do a project with verso or something but you know they're um they're not going to be interested in a lot of things that we might have to present so um it's about finding out your your quickest way to publication with a with a bona fide legitimate quality publisher and you know that might not be the biggest name on the block but you might have a much better chance of getting something published but also you might have a much better um, experience of the publishing process if you choose you know um, a specific publisher for your particular project so i think that's very important doing doing your research finding out what the trends are um, and what what different publishers are clearly publishing at the moment um, ask about what you know reach out to the publishers you know via their websites speak to the commissioning editor most relevant to your project see if you can get some 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 facetime via zoom or via a phone call or something uh, and ask them questions about like whether you they think your work would fit what are the trends what are they focusing on um and most of us will be pretty clear and upfront about that um because it's mutually beneficial that we all get it right so there's a, I mean, there's a couple of things there that I think are, are definitely worth mentioning. Um, but you said mistakes. Uh, so I can highlight a couple of things that I've seen recently. Um, so someone, someone had, uh, had uh, submitted a, um, a proposal to me and many of these proposals are now done via what we would call an author questionnaire. So most publishers will have their own specific author questionnaire, including branding and all the rest of it. Um, so, so someone submitted to me a proposal on a Bloomsbury author questionnaire form. Now, one that's going to concern me about your, uh, you know, ironically, they'd said they had great attention to detail as well. So I thought well, that was kind of funny, really. So I'm going to be concerned about your, uh, your, your, your attention to detail. Um, but also, of course, you know, it's no one wants to see that. So there's a bit of a mistake you see quite often is people, rather than doing that research and finding the publisher, perhaps they most want to work with and selecting a few, and sending in proposals to a couple of different publishers and seeing what comes of it they just kind of you know a bit like someone who's going for a job and rather than picking selectively where they approach they just send out 15 proposals and those kind of mistakes start to creep in and happen so i think again it's sort of it's in line you know don't um i mean yeah basically just make sure you're sort of doing your due diligence and choosing the right publisher for you and then um ensure that someone's helping you when it comes to proofreading and checking your own author questionnaire because you'll be surprised how bad or how poorly written many of these author questionnaires or proposals are um and so i, I really would recommend that you have that uh, that all checked out as well 
it's definitely a really important thing. Um, I mean, but I mean, to go back to basics again, so mo most, mo most publishers will have an author questionnaire now, which will ask very specific questions. Um, and over half of that questionnaire is probably likely to be related to marketing and sales. Um, you know, the market in general, and especially when we're dealing with quite niche academic research that we're trying to present as a book, often you um, and your colleagues around you will be the, the experts who will know the field more than, than we will do as publishers potentially, or certainly will have you know, inside roots. So focusing a lot on that, the marketing and the sales, and considering that from the outset, I think is very important as well. Um, yes, obviously the methodology, Yes, of course, you know what theory and who you've engaged with um, and all these elements about the content itself are vitally important. But um, almost in this day and age, it seems to be perhaps more vital to have an awareness of where the project fits and if it's feasible as a book. Um, so being able to present that, promote that. Um, again, with Sabrina, she presented lots and lots of different kind of courses and blogs and people who would you know vouch for the project and who'd want to purchase it um you know libraries courses all these different things so she clearly considered all of those aspects which uh, you know so basically you're just helping us um speed up the process so if i don't have to do all that research you know because you've done a good job of it and an honest job of it i think that's very important too and, and quite often you'll get a proposal in and someone's done a very poor or very scant job of the, the sort of the, the marketing sections. But to be honest, often these days in this competitive world, they're the bits that might get you the contract ahead of the content itself, potentially. Yeah. I mean, to add to this, I mean, when I did my monograph proposal at first, I had no fucking clue what I was doing <laughs> because you, we were not being taught at all. Um, I think specifically also in the German university setting, which is ironic beyond belief, just because we're, I think, the only market I'm aware of, or like the only academic setting where we definitely have to publish our thesis. I mean, more and more people do so, and it's good for their CV, but we're like forced to do this. And if we don't, we're gonna lose our title. So basically, as soon as I get copies of my monograph in October, I have to run to my university library and hand them in the copies because I'm on a ticking clock. Um, and because of the system we're in, um, and I mean, I know there's like nuances between universities as well, but most of the time our like thesis advisors are doing a really bad job of actually preparing us for that part of the process. Like it's not really being discussed. So suddenly we have to figure out how to get this published in a very short amount of time. And I think I'm, I'm trying to counteract this a little bit, even if it's just with like a few people in this chat here, because what you can do to kind of avoid also the math scramble as soon as you hand it in is, I think, because as you rightly said, the book has not, it does not have to be complete for you to write a book proposal. So what you can do, I think, and that's a whole issue as well, because I don't think, and I've heard of thesis advisors in Germany, professors who frown upon uh, students kind of workshopping this to publishers before it's even handed in but I don't really see like I would honestly at least ask your advisor if they're okay with this um, and if they're not what you can still do I think you can at least start looking kind of once you handed it in um, officially and then you usually have a few months before your thesis defense and obviously you're going to get kind of notes for corrections for the final manuscript but i mean you will go through under go review with the publishers well anyway so it's not like you you you're going to work like you're going to talk about the completely final book to the publisher so i think my personal advice from the german system would be to look as early as you can and you feel is feasible and you know that this is the book you're gonna have so maybe around the time you hand in with your university and then you have a few of these months before your defense to kind of talk to publishers figure it out because from experience like even if you end up with the publisher you first ask this it can take a few months for them to have the time to review and i know that sometimes it can be quick but if if everybody's kind of swamped it can take i don't know like three months easy sometimes longer definitely 
before you even get anything back. So, um, yeah, and also do all that research that James just highlighted can take you a while as well. Um, and again, it's a kind of learning curve how to figure out how to fill out these proposal forms to begin with, and especially the marketing section and that kind of research that you have to do. So I think you, sh you should actually start looking early because that takes a lot of pressure off you um, that you otherwise might have if you start doing this too late. And I mean, I, I ask very early, but then I kind of dropped the ball and then I didn't get back to trying to publish it until like six months after my defense. And suddenly I'm under a lot of time pressure to get this out. So, um, so yeah, um, maybe some points towards specifically, like what's the difference between a thesis and a monograph from your perspective? I just want to add, though, um, this kind of is relevant to the German context, which, of course, I'm no expert on. Um, but but it's not like, especially with this kind of work, it's not a problem if the publisher asks for some funding or a subvention, especially if you can get it via a grant or an award body or something like that. And ordinarily, it'd be late in your career and it would be an institutional grant from your university, etc., to help us. Um, break even on what is on what's likely to be a very niche and specialist project. So there's nothing wrong with a publisher asking for money towards the cost of production, but you need to be very careful what they're asking it for. Um, and then you also again need to do that due diligence and ensure that the peer review process is legit and you're not buying into a vanity publication here. Because all that's going to do is uh okay this, this is one reason i said this in the german context is because if you have to publish and you're under time constraints you know someone's saying oh i can get that done for you but you know chuck us a couple grand or whatever so the thing is is like you need to stick to your guns and do your due diligence in terms of the quality of the press you need to check their reputation you need to be very careful of the contract what it stipulates you know are you getting the royalty all these different things you know um will it be peer reviewed who's peer reviewing it what is the peer review process how will it be made available? Will it be made available in print and online or, you know, as an ebook? Will it be available internationally? Who is the distribution partner? You know, will they do any marketing? Do they have a sales team? All these different things should come into, you know, into your mind when you're sort of considering who to work with. And that should even be more important when you're, you know, you're under pressure from like the system, you know, like you are in Germany, because, you know, this could potentially be one of the best things you write or could, you know, could be, you know, thing that makes your career. And if you choose the wrong publisher, it'll be completely degraded, you know, and you'll miss out on that, you know, a real opportunity. So I just say, be very careful who you work with and just do, again, just do your due diligence. Um, so to go to your point, the difference between a thesis and a monograph, well, um, well, in short, obviously the thing with a thesis, um, whatever the level really, but especially if you're talking about PhDs, is you're proving to you know uh, a research council whatever you know you're, you're 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 saying that i've done all this research here is everything i've researched here's all the important voices within the field i know about all of them and then here's my opinion on top of that and here's my own kind of thesis right um that's not of interest in a book that's just um that's verbose you know that's just a load of like the idea of like saying a the kind of literary review you would do for a, a humanities thesis or especially kind of you know, a cultural studies or you know, literature thesis or something, it's going to be monumental. And like that would be like a couple of, be a few pages, you know, in a, in, a, in a book. So they're often long, over 100, 100,000 words. A book you're looking, they're probably going to be, most publishers aren't going to let you go over 90 for the most part now. Um, and like it's understood that the reader, especially with like a research monograph, knows all of that stuff or certainly doesn't need it signposted for them you know you can have your further reading and you can have like you know obviously your index and bibliography and, and obviously adequately referenced text and all the rest of it but not it doesn't have to all be signposted and again it's like with um, like qualitative and quantitative data a lot of that gets cut out straight away so it's like uh, people will spend a long time talking about their methodology about their literary review um, and then they'll you know they'll highlight and signpost things Whereas when you're writing a book, that's really boring to read. So you don't need to prove any of those things. What you're doing is you're, you're assuming that the reader you know, has that knowledge. And I think that's some of the, the key things. So some of the big differences would be, yeah, like methodology, literary review would be cut out. 
the tone and style of the writing will need to change. But a lot of that comes down to the publisher because the publisher will have an editorial team who will focus on copy editing. So they will tidy up your prose, you know, tidy up your, 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 um, your writing. Um, some will do a, more, than, more of that than others. So the tone definitely needs to change. Um, the length will definitely change. And then of course, you know, you need to ensure that you have the rights and everything to use images, texts, all these kinds of things, because none of that will be possible if you don't, when it comes to you know, a book that's gonna be published, where you get away with it with a dissertation. Um, so yeah, it's kind of, it's, a lot of it's really about style and making it more succinct and sharp. But you've all read plenty of books, so you all know that anyway. But um, you know, it's, it's and one of the things you'd have to do to go out to the proposal question is with a publisher like Intellect, where we, we're happy to publish dissertations, but um, we'd want you to justify and explain how you are going to develop this. Then you will get to work with our team, editorial team, copy editing team, to you know to make it more more uh, accessible, succinct, sharp, and all the rest of it. But um, you'll in the proposal need to sort of highlight that you realise that it's a dissertation and it will need to be developed. Yeah, and I mean to add to the money uh, aspect or the funding aspect as well, because it is quite common um, for German publishers, even the more reputable ones, to ask for a substantive amount of money. Um, and quite often, even if that's the case, you will end up having to do um, all your copy editing yourself, basically. So quite often, like, I mean, I've talked to people who have published here, obviously. Um, and basically, you do all the work, but you pay um, two to three thousand euros easy for the pleasure of doing all the work. And you're not going to get peer review, peer review anyway. Um, that means it's not valuable internationally. Sorry to interrupt you, but that, that's very important. If it's not legitimately peer reviewed and it's not available internationally, you effectively thrown it away. All you're getting is you're getting that, that tick from the German side of things, from the academics, you know, from the academy over there. But you can use an internationally reputable publisher who will operate peer review, even if they are maybe wanting some money towards the cost of publication. And then that means that you've got yourself a real foot in the door like globally and then you're much more likely to be able to get employed in the US or the UK or you know different countries in Europe or any part of the English language speaking academic world let's say in that context so sorry to interrupt but I think that's really important to you to like highlight that yeah definitely so I mean even if you have to raise a bit of money it's still a difference between having to pay several thousand euros and not even getting any kind of feedback any kind of copy editing any kind of that thing so and um I mean, I, I got three peer reviewers anonymously, so this is usually the standard. I mean, I've done other projects for other reputable publishers, and sometimes this was one or two, but either way, there was definite anonymous peer review from somebody you could tell was an expert on the subject. And you should have that because it will make it a better book. Um, and obviously that is another factor that will take time. That's why I'm saying like, if you have time constraints, then do get started early because then you have more time for all of this. I mean, I still have a few regrets where I'm like, had I had another year, I probably would have done a bit more even in terms of reworking certain aspects. It doesn't mean that the final book is bad, at least I don't hope so. But you know, there's there's always that difference of like, you don't want to sit there later thinking, oh my God, had I just published somewhere else or under different circumstances, because you, because you can take it back. Like you will, you will sell away the rights to your book, right? So you can't come back yep. to it. Um, yeah. Can I, just, can I just add in a couple of things there? And I want to go back to that idea of the contract again, especially if you're under pressure, you need to be very careful what you sign, because again, your intellectual property rights could be in some kind of jeopardy if you work with an unreputable company um, or they could be free to, uh, to charge you money and this is reputable companies do this too down the line to release chapters so that then you can use them um, to form the basis of anthologies or to form the basis of maybe an article in a journal so you need to be careful that there's, there's also there's um, I'm jumping around again but the idea of embargo now that open access is a huge component to the kind of work we're doing you need to be certain that you there's no embargo on you using your own work because you know some of this book could, could be very good but people could be like well can you develop this for an article and because it's 
too closely aligned with the book, you might be under contractual obligation not to publish anything anywhere else that relates to it for a couple of years. And again, that could like completely foul your career. So be very careful with the contract. Uh, make sure you read it and have a look at, know what everything means because they're changing um, rapidly. All right. uh, we have a chat question, um, a follow-up question on market research. How specific does it have to be? Do you need to quote specific librarians saying they'll buy my book or is it enough to show that libraries buy books like mine? I mean, I mean basically the, the, the more specific you can be, the better but again don't like don't like you know freak out about that it's just if you can go and approach some libraries or librarians or if there are lecturers or, or people working in the field at different universities who can say oh i would support this with my library that would be great anyone who can effectively um you know co-sign you anyone who can effectively be in a sort of ambassador for you um especially if they're known in the field then that's really cool. Um, but just to show that you've done your research and that you can highlight 10 courses or 10 libraries that are likely to be interested that I can pass on to my sales reps or that I can present because you know every book that we contract has to get presented to a team of reps and you know, marketing colleagues from different companies. You know, like I work with the University of Chicago Press in terms of distribution and sales and, and marketing. You know, so I have to present all these books to them. So what you put in that author questionnaire forms the basis of how we sell the book further down the line because you know i'll read a lot of the books and i'll read big chunks of a lot of them but there's no way that i can do you know i can i can read the whole thing of everything you know so i will have to rely upon things like the author questionnaire to highlight certain certain key sales points um so you know that's important kind of information definitely but um yeah, don't get freaked out, but the more you can do and the more, you know, precise you can be, the better. Um, another thing I should just add here. One thing I'd like to recommend to people is while you're writing the dissertation thesis, you should be looking at shopping um, journal articles. You should be trying to publish in peer reviewed journals. You should be trying to take an aspect of it and submit that to journals. First of all, expect to be knocked back, um, you know, and potentially not have that opportunity. But you've got to try because one, then you've got something you can add to the proposal when you approach a publisher. This was published in this, this chapter was published in here, this article which relates to this key aspect of my thesis was published here. Um, but I can then go and look at like the, the book, the numbers, like the citations, I can look at like the circulation. And that's going to give me a clear indication of whether you know this has got legs you know so that's like a really good thing to do but moreover to go back to what sabrina said earlier is um you know rather than just relying upon your friends and that you know your academic colleagues but then also your you know your supervisor you're then getting top peers within the field from a from a potentially a, a well-regarded publication giving you feedback that can then help you develop your actual dissertation and thesis so I say from the start, you should be looking to kind of at least try to engage with journals and try to get, you know, shorter, you know, five to 8,000 word article length pieces uh, out there because, you know, it's flagging your name. You know, you, you're much more likely to, it's going to open doors for you with publishers and then obviously with future journals, it's going to already, you know, it's going to tick towards career progression before you've even completed your dissertation. And as I said, you're going to get a lot of great feedback from people who are, you know, going to be you regard and going to be renowned, you know, renowned in the field potentially. So I would really recommend that as well as a as a good little tactic. Yeah. People, it's just a misnomer as well. Is a lot of people don't believe you can publish in journals until you've got a PhD, which of course it's 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 not true. It's, that's 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 the BS, you know. Um, and it will very much help you if you if you can get published sooner rather than later. And I mean, even if for whatever reason you can't get published or you have a publication in the works and sometimes journals take months to years to actually get them out, obviously. Uh, I feel like even if you can just go, and I mean now during the pandemic, this has gotten a lot harder, but everything's online at least, to like go to a conference and at least present 
work related to your thesis at a conference because that's also immediate feedback from people and additionally you can talk to publishers at conferences or at least you used to be able to <laughs> um i mean i certainly hope we'll get back there because that certainly helped me like i we wouldn't be sitting here now if if it weren't for conferences and having the kind of face-to-face -face contact and i mean that that also obviously makes it easier to to talk to somebody and and work uh, see a bit it, like which publishers might work for you might not work for you see what their output is speak to somebody there i mean in the end you also have to work be able to work with the people at the publisher and i know obviously there's reputable publishers but they're huge so you might not get like very personalized i don't know like contact um working relationship with people like I've, I've had very positive experience obviously with, with smaller presses because just because they're smaller they may still have a huge workload but i feel like it's it's a much more personalized experience i have a book with rutledge and rutledge is huge and they're doing good work but it's just you're probably not going to have a super close relationship with your editor or whomever like i mean i hear about my editor's cat so you know <laughs> um, shout out to helen's cat um but <laughs> that that kind of thing and i mean that's that that's obviously not a prerequisite but it can be so much nicer if you have kind of a personal relationship with people especially if it's your first book and you're so kind of scared and insecure about where this is going to go so i feel like if it's a reputable press but it's smaller it might have a massive benefit to you if this is your first book and then you know if you actually have an academic career and you have a second book down the line you might end up with a different publisher for that and it's bigger but you know that the drill at that point um so yeah it's 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 nice to to be able to have that because i think it also takes away some of the fear we have going into this because i know it's scary to suddenly go oh god i have to approach these publishers and write this proposal and come up with all of this marketing stuff and i have absolutely no clue what i'm doing etc etc <laughs> so um yeah but um as james can attest i have learned how to write book proposals um, most definitely yes <laughs> um but uh yeah and um, we had a very specific question from uh, carrie who's in the chat before he she was asked by a publisher to write a mini proposal before she writes a bigger one do you have any clue what that might entail do you ever do that i always i always do that um personally i do that because okay so just to, to again to link in with what you were saying about conferences so um some of the larger conferences that i i would normally attend and i would attend you know 30 a year perhaps to be fair i go to a lot but you know but basically <laughs> you you might meet with you know i might have 50 meetings and then you probably meet hundreds and hundreds of people or pitching ideas at you so if it's something that sounds kind of fly then effectively i'll ask them to do me a mini like an almost like an extended elevator pitch because I don't want to waste my time, but I don't want to waste theirs either. You know, you can hand me, you know, if people come up and they have their, their, their like manuscript, I'm like, well, what am I going to do with that? Like, wait to my door, you know, what am I going to do? You know, I ain't got time for that. Um, what I need is to very clear and concise and succinct. This is what this is. And then I can be like, right, cool. Now we can get you to do the author questionnaire. Because if you do the author questionnaire quickly, um, as I've said already, you're probably in trouble. But if you, you know, if you do it correctly, it's um you no know, it's as, as if it's your first it's probably quite a bit of work goes into it so i just think it's a, it's just a decent thing really to when a, when, a, when an editor asks you to give them basically sort of a a mini proposal an extended pitch what's this all about really um and you know and all it's just simple things as well like if you want 150 full color pages uh but it's about like the underside of desks in Romanian classrooms, then it might be a little difficult to make that work feasibly financially, you know what I'm saying? So it's kind of like, we just, we just want to know what we're dealing with rather than before we all go down, before we all spend three months like working on it, you know what I'm saying? So yeah, I would actually argue and uh, stand by that, that the, the, the mini proposal is a great thing. And the other thing is, it's like if you haven't got the time to have like an extended meeting with someone at a conference and they've just come up and pitched to you, You'll remember them kind of, you know, and I'll take a card and I'll write notes on it, things of that nature. But yeah, like if you get asked to do a mini proposal, first of all, that's a good sign. Um, 
it's basically an extended written elevator pitch as far as I'm concerned. But you know, I want e people sending me emails. And my advice here as well is if you do go to a conference or some kind of physical event, do have business cards. You can make them yourself. They don't have to look fancy or anything. Even if you're not affiliated with a university, do have business cards. Because what I will do is I will take your business card and I'll write basic notes on the back. And then that's for me and my follower. And if I'm excited by something, that's how I'll do it. There you go. I had one million. They don't, they don't look at. They don't look good, and she's got two book contracts. <laughs> I have like a million of them printed now, and then the pandemic happened, so I am not sure if I'm ever going to be in a room with anybody again. But you know, I had them made. No, but that's you know that's that's definitely important. The other thing that you can do is you can create um, like a one pager, printed one pager. You know, like a four piece of paper um which does that you know and I, I think i think if you want to hedge your bets at a conference or anything physical like that make sure you turn up with business cards and then if you're pitching something seriously have a one pager um have worked on your elevator pitch i'm talking like a minute you know bang there it is um and then be ready to do one of these sort of mini proposals too in terms of over email and if someone asks you to do it and you're serious, like do it that night if you can, because you'll, you know, you're giving yourself every opportunity to be ahead of the curve. Yeah, definitely. Um, actually, that also I think kind of ties in with. Uh, huh. Wait, there's a question. Um, okay. Uh, somebody that's writing her thesis in German actually. Would you recommend having it translated into English? before publishing and publishing it with an international publisher? Or is it also pu possible to publish it in German with a German publisher and publish it in English later with an international publisher? So yeah, it, def it definitely is possible to do that, the latter, but um, you're not gonna be doing yourself any favors. I think if you're confident that you think the work's good and you reckon you can get it published, I would pitch for the English language publisher first and foremost. Um, but then again, if you are doing it, as you said, in German and, and you're in that, um, if you can get someone to translate it, if you know someone who can, uh, et cetera, et cetera, or you're thinking about that, that's a very good idea because very few publishers, unless it's like a really, you know, unless it sounds like an absolute bona fide winner slash classic, you know, on the, on, you know, on the cards there, um, translations normally paid for by the author. Um, or the university, or the association, or something like that. Um, you can't expect an English language publisher to, they'll, they'll do all the copy editing and stuff, so it can be like a good translation, but not necessarily, you know, 100%, um, and then the publisher should be able to sort that out, no problem, via copy editing procedures. But, um, yeah, it's a, it's a, you, you, if you're going to write it in German, you need to probably have to think about how you're going to get it translated yourself. It's a bit like with indexes as well, slight tangent here, but like most publishers may not cover the cost of an index. So you need to save up a few hundred euros or, you know, you need to do it yourself or have someone who can do it. And uh, I can tell you that that sucks. That's a really bad job. So um, I'd, I'd save up some, say get saving those euros. Um, but some publishers will do that. But again, it goes back to my point about making sure you're doing your research and finding out what people will offer you um, and checking your contract and things because it's no point signing a contract and then towards the end of the process you're like well hey, what do you mean what about when when's my index getting done and say like, well whenever you do it you know that's kind of what you're going to encounter if you're not careful so things like translation costs index costs these can be definitely outside of the the remit of the publisher um, but that can obviously be make or break um, also like some publishers will work do co-publication deals so I might work with a German language publisher because German, of course, is a big enough and, more po and a popular enough language within the book world and the academic world specifically that, um, you know, it is worth partnering with certain presses. Um, I do a lot with Spanish, but of course, that opens up most of South America, you know, and then obviously Spain itself academically has a big market too. So we often do these collabs or co-publication deals and that just allows us to do things more effectively in international markets. But I digress, I think, a little bit there. Yeah, I mean, I think 
just specifically, and I can only speak to my university, which is LMU in Munich. Um, what has changed is that you can basically, so you can have your, like to get the title and get away from the time pressure. What you can do is basically have the university put it out as an ebook. So what you might look into is if you have like just your PDF of the dissertation in German basically published with your university library, but a publisher might not take offense to that existing, and James, correct me if I'm wrong, but if the dissertation in German exists somewhere as a PDF, but you can get the English version of it as a proper monograph published, and then you have all the time in the world to translate and work on the monograph, that might yeah. Option. I mean, obviously, that adds on a lot of time and think, but it might be worth considering if you feel like that that gives your project the kind of attention it deserves. Yeah, no, you're you're correct. Um, yeah, I sort of slightly missed that point. Um, yeah, no, definitely that that's a good point because effectively that's like you know everyone's dissertation in say in the UK has to be held in a university repository, you know, as sort of a manuscript. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. So yeah, I think that's that's a good point. And also, some publishers, if they want the book, they'll try and fast track it as an ebook, and then that counts, you know. But then it might take six months longer to get it onto a bookshelf because you know that three three months of that could be about consolidation and shipment to different warehouses globally, so that we can launch it. So that's a good that's a good use of technology potentially. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Got another one. Uh huh. Yep. Uh, okay. Uh, she's planning on finishing her dissertation by the end of the year, and all the, of the larger conferences I was planning on meeting editors that have been cancelled. Any advice on how to approach people? And I know Alan was going to go to PCA with both you, you and me, <laughs> so <laughs> we know what that's like. But yeah. yeah. So how yeah. do you? people now yeah good question well the thing is is like um my job hasn't changed my job's changed in terms of the tactics i use but like i still have to you know i still have to have a pipeline of new books and proposals coming in so my advice is just to be very direct and contact people but again it goes back to my original point about doing that research find out who the right editors are who the right publishers are make sure you've got like a lot of lot of like sort of knowledge of your own project and how it would potentially fit within uh you know a certain publisher's list for example how you think about presenting it to the market all these kind of things and then i'd reach out to them directly and try to get um you know a call or a zoom and like i've always been open to that that's the way i've operated outside of the conference world anyway um but like i know a lot of like the bigger publishers are actually like you know they've been desperate scrabbling about and now they're kind of like you know doing all these kind of like uh, you know like you know online conf labs with people and things to try and commission new titles. So I think it's just again it gives the case of see the other thing is is say with some say with like PCA they uh, yeah let's yeah we'll we'll walk over that one for a minute. Um, but like basically with some of the conferences that are well organised, what they will have is a list of all the um, attendees and a list of all the sponsors and all the publishers who were going to be in the book room. And a lot of them will be more than happy to let you know what companies were going to be available. And then you know who would have been available at a PCA or a College Art Association or a Cultural Studies Association. And then you can reach out to the editors from those companies or call up the switchboard or go on their website. That's what you got to do. That's, not, that's, that's what's happening right now. But like the good news is, is that, you know, my job hasn't changed, it's just, how I contract things has. So that's the way to do it. Yeah. You just spend way more time in your own flat now other than in basements. So Yeah, it kind of sucks. Although, I don't know. I've, yeah, at least I got some sun coming in the window here. Um, you follow up for you, James. With, with which German publishers are you cooperating? Uh, actually, n at the moment, no one. Um, but that doesn't mean we, we won't be in the future. Uh, we used to we used to work with a number of sort of university presses, or then also like some European sort of consortium type presses. But um, no, in Germany, no one right now. But then, for example, I've done um, there's certain kind of like projects I'll do with particular universities that will be published as 
in journals as kind of co almost like co almost co-published deals yeah um and i mean i know that transcript and it's sadly one of the publishers i mentioned early that charges you a lot and doesn't really do a lot of review however they do have a cooperation with an american university press as well so yeah germany is a bit unique in a lot of these things but i mean we do have a few good ones still um i mean uh, I haven't worked with any German publisher actually myself. I just keep hearing a lot of things from other people and I've obviously read books published with German publishers. But you know, there, there may be somebody out there as well that's completely decent. I think the Greuter is a very good publisher, but I mean, we can also talk about that separately at some point if you want to. Um, but um, right, uh, because this is also kind of tying in with this. Um, also when it comes to journals, so since you say, well, you know, just approach people, do your research, where does your work fit? fit uh, what do you say that also applies to journals? And I know there was a specific question also from Carrie that was, um, is it best practice to perhaps approach editors before submitting if you're not quite sure if you're article is even a good fit or not if that's the thing they're looking for or is that maybe frowned upon or you know <laughs> um, it's a little difficult that's definitely depends on the editor and on the editorial team one thing that i would strongly advocate is that you look at the notes for contributors which will be in the back of every journal it'll also be on every website affiliated with a journal whether they be affiliated with a publisher or not um, and they'll be probably quite clear in there if they don't want you to contact them. With an intellect journal, whilst you can submit via a portal, we also have the editor's names and uh, email contacts and affiliations up there. So that obviously means that they're open to you contacting them directly. Whether they get in touch with you, it's a different matter. You put it through the portal and then we can see whether they've responded or not. And then obviously we can jog people's memories if, if that's the case. Um, but no, I would, I would say, you know, reach out to editors and especially if you're unsure of whether it fits the aims and the scope, um, you'll save yourself and them potentially a lot of time as well. But yeah, be very, be very careful and make sure you, you read the, uh, the, the aims and scope of the publication and the notes for contributors. Um, and then also in terms of vetting them, make sure that they have a robust peer review process, which has to mean double blind, which I'm sure people know here. Um, and then see who's on the editorial board. You know, do you recognize those names? Because they're likely to make up a large proportion of the people who will be reviewing the work. So if, you, if, if it's a list of people you would like to be reviewing your work or that you respect, you know you're heading in the right direction. Um, but yeah, like I think expect to get a lot of knockbacks with journals. So I think you, the important thing is you start submitting when you, when you, when you feel the work is you know, getting close. Yeah. Are there any specific tips you have for journal submitting or, you know? Yeah. Yeah. A couple of vital things. So I mentioned earlier, you have a book proposal. It's fine to send it to me and to Routledge and to Bloomsbury. You know, you want to be a little careful. Um, but yeah, no, it's, um, you know, that's fine with a book proposal. Now with a journal article, you submit to one journal and one journal only right you have to wait and that can be very frustrating because it could be six months before they give you an answer and then they're like no they like, oh great thanks thanks guys nice one but um you, you you cannot submit to two journals at the same time because if it's just kind of like you makes you you know persona non grata um and it's just a con considered an industry rule so do not do that so uh, you know, pick your journal carefully and then you have to work out what your main goal and objective is is it to get something published quickly because that's the nature of the research or that's your requirement or are you pushing for like the one with the highest citations and you know the highest rating and all that stuff um i mean find out what yeah again just to reiterate that what's important to you at that period you know do you need color imagery do you need um a journalist you know a journal that's international and printed and available through universities even though it might not be fully open access you know is, is still considered the best and in some countries is a prerequisite for you know for a career you know so i i'd, I'd, I'd consider that 
Uh, again, I've already said it, but really, really, really focus on the notes for contributors and make sure that you provide all the information uh, that they need because it could really slow down the process or just really piss off an editor who then throws your stuff in the bin and will never consider you again. So things like metadata, CV, keywords, this will all be in the notes for contributors. Um, so read that with a fine tooth comb. Uh, here's a good tip. If you haven't published an article before, it's very much worth considering doing a review because every journal has a review section for the most part and they will need a wealth and depth of content for that review. So two tactics there, just do something cool and send it in for consideration or contact the reviews editor directly and ask them if they have anything you know, that they want reviewing. It could be a book, it could be a film, it could be a performance, whatever it might be. Um, the thing is, because that's lightly reviewed and not peer reviewed to the same degree, and they need a load of them, um, it's a really good way for you to prove that you are a safe pair of hands. So it could open the door for you when you want to submit an article. You know, it's a good way to build up your reputation. So I'd strongly advocate that. Um, but again, there's a wealth and depth of material out there in terms of journals that are available, and a lot of them are shit. So make sure you, you do your due diligence and make sure that it has that strong review process again. Um, and I, I think that's, you know, that's you know, some of the key things. But you know a lot of this already. It just needs to be reiterated, I think. Yeah. Um, and again, stuff like um, if you have a lot of images or if it's something like Disney or DC or, Star, you know, like whatever it might be, if you don't have the rights to use the image and it becomes a major part of, like, the article, it's very unlikely it will get published. So, you know, get the rights or don't rely upon certain images or have alternatives that you can utilize. Yeah. And that's a pretty good, pretty good one too. Um, and then again, consider open access, but learn what open access means in its different formats. And uh, you can just go on the internet website, for example, to get a basic overview of what green and gold are and what uh, Creative Commons is, et cetera, et cetera. And loads of other publishers will have that information. Plus you can just find it all online. But um, I'd really understand what that is, and maybe that's something that you might need to pursue, depending. I mean, also, if you submit, um, or the point when you submit, make sure it's formatted according to the style guide, because yeah, very good point. Very good point. <laughs> people do everybody so much, uh, so such a favor to have that done. I mean, it also goes for if you submit a chapter to somebody's edited collection, obviously. And I've edited quite a bit by now. And if people have not followed the style guide, I just want to strangle them. So, um, and journal editors get so much stuff. If it already looks like that's been done, that also makes you feel like, I mean, that just gives a good impression, I think. So even if you don't have that much experience kind of having published before, that at least shows you know what to do. Um, yeah. Like everybody knows there will be a review and that means you will have to edit, but like the content, but at least if all of the kind of bases are covered, I think that already is saying a lot. Um, yeah. I, I, a couple of other recommendations on this as well is um, look for themed issues that might be relevant to work you're already doing. Um, a good way to do that is via social media, via journal websites, or publisher websites, but also the signing up for things like JISC Mail, J I S C M A I L, is basically a CFP forum, and you can sign up to different lists, and they'll send you CFPs and other announcements relating to different subjects, predominantly in the arts and humanities. And then again, there's like University of Pennsylvania has the you know the, the UPenn CFP thing. There's a bunch of these things, so I'd really um, recommend that because most journals will do one themed issue a year at least, and that might be, you know, right up your alley. And you might be able to, you might be able to like, something that might take three years to get published in a general issue, you might be able to expedite and get published in a year or less, you know, because of that. So I'd definitely look at that. Yeah, I've definitely made that experience. So like Journal of Popular Culture is has like a notoriously long backlog and I've known people that have waited for like three years to get their yeah. article out, but I submitted to a special issue they had with somebody I vaguely knew as well. And I, I asked him before, like, do you think that fits? And then obviously it still underwent like review and everything, but it was out in a year or so. And yeah. 
Um, also, when it comes to open access, you can check with your universities. Um, and because when I was just still working at the University of Augsburg, they had a program where their library would make articles open access for me free of charge. So now my article is the only one in that issue that's completely freely available to everybody, which will obviously make my citations go up massively, but it's still yep. a very reputable journal. So the university, if you have any institutional affiliation right now, see if there's anything available by any chance. Um, uh, there's a question. All of my publications are in special issues. Is that bad? Uh, no. Nope. I don't think so either. No, I've not heard anything to, <laughs> to that effect at least. No. no, as long as it's a reputable publication, doesn't matter. No, I mean, it's a similar process as edited collections as books, but usually journals are still reviewed like better because there will be another, there will be a blind peer review process, even if it's a special issue. So, and people know that. Yeah, journals are still definitely regarded um, above chapters in most academic countries, you know, in most sort of, so like, yeah, getting a chapter in a, in a book is cool, but um, yeah, it's probably still better to, to go for a journal article if you can. And again, it's just because it's normally more rigorous. It's one of the definitive formats in academic research. Um, and again, like with, a, with, an, with an anthology or an edited collection, you might have a couple of big names, you might have some really good stuff, but there's also a lot of like dead, low hanging fruits there sort of thing. So just be a little bit careful, just double check what kind of publication and who's publishing it as well. Yeah, um, there's another question uh, from Kerry. I had the opportunity to re revise and resubmit to a journal, but he decided to move the article. So I declined the, that offer and submitted somewhere else uh, because mm. it would have, taken forever basically to then go through the process there again. So I decided to just not continue with them. Is that considered problematic? Uh, no, I don't think so. No. I, I don't I, think so. Yeah. I mean, it's common anyway. It, I mean, it depends. I mean, basically, don't get in the business of burning your bridges. And I think if you're like polite and have rationale and reason for it, I don't see it being a problem. Yeah, I don't think so either. If you cause a lot of trouble and like, you know, spray paint and you're a wanker on their uh, office building, you might be in a bit more trouble down the line. You know, you don't want to, like I say, don't burn your bridges, but, um, you know, you need to look after yourself and what's right for you. And that's fine. Just be professional about it. Yeah. Um, oh, I'm getting a, I'm getting a question to me. I don't know if that's uh, <laughs> just for me, but it's about writing an abstract for a book. So for an edited collection, um, specifically one I'm doing right now, but, uh, generally speaking, uh, what's with that? I mean, um, I guess I can answer that better than you probably. <laughs> yeah, I, think so, yeah. I mean, I don't know, honestly, I mean, I've edited a few books now, um, collections, um, I mean, the call for papers will have told you how many words we want. Stick to that word count, honestly, because I still get people sending me two pages instead of 200 words. And it's the same with everywhere. Like, if I see that, I'm like, you didn't even read the call. Like, why are you wasting my time? So, um, but other than that, I mean, just present a concise argument. An abstract is always that kind of elevator pitch. And obviously, you should fit what the call is like it should fit the topic of the book the same with a special issue for a journal um so you know and i mean if you're unsure and specifically with one of the books i'm doing right now a lot of people were kind of unsure do you then just approach the editors like send me an email and say look i had this idea do you think you're even interested in that for the book and then i would confer with my co-editors and we were like yeah sure that sounds great just send us an abstract and then we say well i don't think that fits our scope then we will tell you but then nobody's time is wasted so again i think it's in that case it's definitely not that like an issue to approach the editors of a book because it makes everybody's life a lot easier and other than that just stick to kind of the rules they put out they put them there for a reason because it's much easier to read several 200 or 300 word abstracts rather than like many <laughs> many manuscripts for books already um so yeah i think that but it, it's kind of the same process for a lot of these things um 
yeah um we had another prepared question about kind of new formats of publishing because i know there's people that work on projects that are perhaps not strictly academic that may be between creative writing and academic writing or that bit more experimental also with the arts um, and I know you have a large catalog of kind of arts related projects so maybe you can speak a bit to that um, how you handle kind of these projects perhaps um, yeah I mean I think ironically a lot of this kind of publishing even if the research projects uh, especially practice led ones are quite dynamic and modern often there's quite like a simple published research output that comes in book format however we're open to and many publishers are now hosting content you know whether it be you know digital audio files whatever it might be um, on our online through our websites as our websites have improved or through different sort of um, i suppose repositories and things of that nature so that's definitely the case i think one of the key things is that that even though what I've just said, there's also like, we think about content more in general now. Um, so in that sense that a lot of our books and our journals, although they're sold individually to individuals and to libraries, what we do is we often, we start, you know, we're chopping things up and create tailored packages for different individuals, for courses or for libraries. So we're open to rather than things being considered as unique we're, we're always looking to, to sort of create these more these larger more augmented products um, but um yeah i don't know what we see i mean we, you know for example especially through covid obviously ebooks and digital online sales have gone up a lot printed books did drop off but then we've seen a big return to that i know bloomsbury today posted to 20 percent i think 20 percent increase in printed book revenue um you know so it's it's pretty traditional still or or it has been you know or it, other than like the big changes the fact that everything's kind of you know convergence has occurred and everything's available in digital form now uh, i don't see there was a lot of talk about you know for example augmented reality apps a few years ago and they never came to anything they cost too much no one wants to buy them you know or like we had our world film locations book project and we wanted to turn that into something that could be like on your on your iphone or whatever you could walk around and you know rather than you be reading about it you could you know you could put your camera at it and then it would bring up a bit like say like a you know a solar system app one of those things that looks at the you know, sky at night kind of things something like that but with film locations with clips and information and blah 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 um but none of that really came too much not just for us but for anyone else either so I don't know, I hope that's not really a very clear answer, but there's, you know, it's kind of, we're open to things, but there's not really any great changes. It's just that there's more like opportunities to do interesting things because everything's now considered content rather than being sort of in its own silo perhaps. But yeah. people still want to buy books, whether they be virtual, digital, or whether they be printed, you know, for the most part. And if it's just kind of different approaches to writing things, then, I mean, is that a project, is that a problem to market? So if it's not strictly academic writing, but it's also not strictly another thing. I mean, I guess it comes down to finding kind of the niche for the market in any case. Yeah, we do a lot of those kind of projects, but they're very difficult to make successful because they're, they often fall between the cracks. So again, it goes back to you knowing exactly what you've got and why you need to do it like that. You know, I mean, like, it's all very well and good if you like create some kind of like no Naomi Klein no logo type project uh, with that you know academic crossover you know to that degree and a you know more contemporary version of that. But most people don't. They think they've got something, but it would be better as an academic monograph. And it's just kind of like hubris in a sense that people really push it um, down that way. But you know that's not to say that you shouldn't be considered you know at the same time. It's just you need to be very kind of clear whether that, whether that's something that actually needs to happen or whether that's just something that you kind of your your, your kind of ego wants maybe perhaps um, because things fall through the cracks at that point and then that can be very problematic. Yeah, um, and one of the other questions I had prepared, uh, the last one actually I had prepared, um, was about kind of the markets that you reach. And I mean, you already talked a bit about you work with University of Chicago Press, which is obviously massive in the United States, but um, 
like how do you do how do you go about that and then maybe also how do you reach other markets because believe it or not it's not just europe and the us that exist and we sometimes tend to still forget that <laughs> well i mean there's a few things i suppose for we're very focused on international markets and always have been and that means truly global um because you just need to be because one like that's the nature of like making something academically viable in many ways it needs to increasingly be available globally but also to be international in the perspectives it deals with um so yeah we have partners all over the world and a lot of them are actually you know collaborative partners of ourselves in the university of chicago um but yeah we have you know warehouses and we have distribution channels and we have reps in all the major markets and our books are available in most countries also for say like certain countries that are um, less economically developed we give away our content for free we're looking at doing that for some inner city libraries and things as well less economically developed areas within affluent countries you know like sort of more like ghettoized parts of say new york or dc or something in the states um yeah i'm so i mean yeah i mean we we, we commission and we promote and we distribute globally and any reputable academic publisher should be doing all of those things um i mean how do we do that it depends on the market some ways traditional through simple book repping you know book agents going into retail outlets or online outlets um and then a lot through you know libraries but you know i just i you know before all this covid stuff i was in mexico and you know, I would have been in China, I would have been in Australia, I would have been in the US, I would have been in many places in Europe, all within a sort of a six month period, because I need to know what's going on there, I need to make sure that our local partners are reaching those outlets. And then also, you know, just I'll, I'll be doing additional sales and making sure everything's sort of functioning as well. Um, does that answer the question? Sorry, that's probably a bit vague. I don't know if that's... Um, cool. Uh, do we have other questions from our people in the audience <laughs> at that point. Otherwise I might have an addition to monograph publishing as well. Um, I might as well say what you think about if you have more questions. Um, because I just, um, I mean, one other way you can, um, when you want to publish a monograph, whether that's your thesis or not, um, obviously book series do also exist that have a specific uh, thematic focus um and if that happens to be an issue fall into that might actually expedite perhaps the process of publishing or makes it easier for you to kind of immediately find that niche because if you i think if you convince the series editor of the book series that this fits their scope then you have already the kind of one big hurdle because i'm fairly certain i mean i know that it will go undergo review with people at the publisher themselves but I think if a book series editor approaches the publisher and says, well, you know, this is, this is what we want for the series, I think that's one big hurdle that's taken. And correct me if I'm wrong, James, but um, I think that book series can be a good way to kind of get a project out as well. I mean, it, 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 otherwise it's like any other monograph, but it can give you a home. And there's people or libraries that subscribe to a book series anyway. So that might give you more exposure than if it's kind of a singular. Yeah, that's definitely, it depends on the series and on how the market's reacting to series at that time. But yeah, you're correct. Like that potentially is a fast track to a, you know, a, a, a good check or a high circulation citations. Um, but just, yeah, just again, it's, it just depends on how, how those things are going at the time. You know, series used to be really popular, but now there's only a few that are actually successful. But if you can get involved in one of those, or even start one potentially, then yeah, then I'd agree with that, for sure. I'm currently submitting to one for you, actually. Haven't even told you. <laughs> but yeah, um, <laughs> hope you're not getting tired of my proposals yet. No, uh, never. Okay, uh, is, are there more questions from anybody? Because I think otherwise we've basically covered a lot of everything um well I, I just will just to interject briefly I, i'll give you my email address and then if anyone has any specific follow-up questions uh feel free to email me directly or if anyone wants to pitch anything um feel free to do that too um i know there's a lot to take in, in one of these kind of like q a sessions so um yeah just so you have it my name is james campbell 
and I'm here representing Intellect Books and Journals. You can go onto Intellect's website at www.intellectbooks.com, find out a lot of information and download a lot of free Q&A type information like that we've been discussing. But if you have a specific question for me, uh, just reach out to me at james at intellectbooks.com. Uh, drop me an email and I will happily get back to you at my earliest convenience. Exactly. And um, yeah, I doubt anybody wants to talk to me about this, but I think most of you know where to find me anyway. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I've at least got some experience in all of this, I think. So, um, yes. So we, we're getting a thank you for everything. This discussion was full of valuable information. So I think we did our job. Um, and with that, I think I will also end this recording at the very least. <laughs>